you. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to Clough United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here in worship with us this morning, where you are invited to come connect, grow, and serve your roadmap to meaningful purpose. And you are welcome here, no matter where you have come from and no matter where you are going, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love. All of you is welcomed into this time of worship by a God who loves you, knows you by name, and wants a personal relationship with you. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. So just a reminder of the breakfast with Santa. Uh, I'm sure that there's still openings for uh, you to come. They would like a, a nice turnout. And so um, bring friends, family, um, <clears throat> neighbors. Um, we will have Christmas Eve service here at 7 p.m. This will be a combined service of Clough and Cherry Grove, 7 p.m. Christmas Day service is 1045, and we're going to probably try to have a, a fun service with, you know, some hot chocolate and something to eat, and kids can wear their PJs, and you all can come in your ugly sweater. Oh. Well. They're not ugly, they're Christmas sweaters. So we just wanna, you know, given that, um, you know, we will already have had a, a worship service on that on Saturday and then to get up uh, that Sunday, but you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. So we'd like as many of us to, to come and worship on Sunday. And so we are in our Advent uh, series, The Ultimate Gift, and this is the third Sunday in Advent. And so now, uh, Brian Wallace is going to come before us. Good morning. I'm looking around the room, and I think I know everybody in here, so I don't have to introduce myself much. Um, so a couple things. We're going to be talking about giving, and our concentration, our estimate of giving cards, uh, we will turn in next week. And Lindy's going to pass those out. Lindy, you want to go ahead and start doing that? And Don's going to help. And they have two things to give you. One is the actual card, which you'll get. You just need one per family. Um, and then the other is some information. It has two things on the, on the front, and one on the front, one on the back. And it just has some information. We'll talk about the human part of this. Um, most people want to know some facts before they, you know, spend any money or, or donate any money. And there's two pieces of this. One on one side is a chart that gives you a breakdown. You can figure out what percentage of your money you are giving. Now, when you've read, if you, you know, most of you have read this thing called the Bible. You've heard of that, right? Uh, and the Bible emphasizes and talks about a tithe being a tenth, a tenth of the first fruits of the Old Testament. Um, so you can look at your, the chart on there, figure out what your weekly income is, and, and that you know what you're giving, uh, and see what percentage you're giving, and see where you, where you stand, and then see if you wanted to move up 1 or 2%, how much more that would be. So it just gives you some details, some financial facts, uh, and see where you st stand and where you might want to be and what the cost would be. The other side of that, that chart is a staircase that looks like this without the scribbling on it. And a lot of times when, we, when we're uh, dealing with money, we want to know, well, what's everybody else doing? What, what's everybody else giving? Well, we're not a church that prints that out so that you can see how much Donna Rogers gave last week or last year. Not going to do that. We're never, ever going to send you a bill and say, well, this is what you make, this is what you should give us. We're not going to do that. We don't believe that. Giving is between you and God uh, and financial people in the church who have to see it. Um, so this just gives a chart of numbers. There are 45 what we call giving units in our church. Now, the Wallace family would be a giving unit. The Staling family would be a giving unit. Um, Donna Rogers is her own giving unit right now. Uh, Jeanette Grant is her own giving unit. Um, so that's what we mean by giving unit, uh, a family or a person. I, um, and there on that chart, it shows you where everybody, where numbers stand. Like at the very bottom, you see 
it starts in this really small number. So some, if you're like me, you have to look at this at home or you have to get out your phone and turn the magnifier on or take a picture of it and blow it up. And I see people going, yep, yep, yep. Um, but at the bottom, it starts off with like, you know, zero to five dollars a week, five to ten dollars a week on up to ten to twenty dollars a week. And at the top, it's 200 or more per week. And that shows how many giving units in our church are on each level. For example, there are three people in our, three units in our church, families, who are giving $200 or more per week. And five here are giving between $150 and $200 per week. And you go on down in the middle, you see that there are eight who are giving $20 to $30 a week. All of those are important, aren't they? Every one of those numbers is important. But that just gives you an idea what other people in our church are giving. Um, and you, you know, if you are giving $20 a week, and like, oh, look at all those people above me. No, that's not, that's not necessarily what we're asking you to look at. Because some of you may not make $200 a week, so it's pretty hard to give $200 a week, isn't it? And you're not giving, we're not asking you to give 100% or 50% or anything like that. All right, so that's some... Some human interest, where you, where you rank on the percentages and what other people are giving, generally people just want to know that. Now, on to the other issues, which are more important. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, Paul wrote, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what we would ask you to do is to be a cheerful giver. You need to, to pray, you need to be in touch with the Holy Spirit, and you need to come to a comfortable place with God on what you're giving that you are cheerful about it and want to do it. We do not want you to feel like, oh, they handed this chart off and chart out in church, and I'm not giving 10 percent. They're demanding. No, we're not demanding anything of you. We're asking that you give what you and God thinks is right, and that you be cheerful about it and feel good about it. In Acts 20, verse 35, Paul reminds us of Jesus' words of, "It is more important, it is more blessed to give than to receive." And what a better time to think about that than Christmas. Now, if you are, you know, Rory's age, Rory might be thinking, eh, I don't think so. I'm kind of looking forward to some nice presents this, this Christmas. Now, Tenley is thinking, well, I kind of want to agree with Rory, but I know better. I'm not sure. I'm in between. But... Uh, Tony and Janet are probably thinking, they're probably more, what do you think, Tony and Janet, are you more excited about what you're going to give to your girls than what you're getting for yourself? Janet is. <laughs> Tony's thinking, where's my season Bengals ticket here? Uh, so as we get older, we especially appreciate, we get a lot of joy in giving, don't we? We get a lot of joy in giving, whether it be you know, there's not always a lot of joy in writing a check and putting it in the offering box or scanning the code back there and doing it on our phone or signing a, the form saying we're going to take a certain amount every week, you know, from your bank account. That's not necessarily the joyful part. But knowing what it does, knowing that, it, that the money you give to our church goes to so many good things and helps so many people should give us a warm feeling in our heart. And when you actively give, when you are helping in Jack's Closet and seeing the joy, that you know, the Jack's Closet event this week was amazing. These people come in, they have kinship kids, they're taking care of their grandkids mostly because life has not been good to the kids' family. And we're able to provide them with Christmas gifts and wrapping paper and gift cards and all kinds of things. How can you do that and not bring joy? Uh, when we take bags to, to kids and they get to eat over the weekend, how can that not bring joy? Uh, when we know we're providing a place for, in our church for 
um, AA meetings where people are recovering from addiction that's destroyed their lives and they're starting anew. How can that not bring joy? If you step up your giving at all, if you're able to do that, when you, when you pray about this and you get in touch with the Holy Spirit and he's nudging you there, hey, what about one more percent? What does that do? That allows us to help more people. That's what that does. All the things you know that our church does for people, we can do more of that if there's more giving. In my life, I have found that I've never regretted giving. I've regretted many purchases in life, things that I've bought for myself or experiences we paid for that didn't work out the way we wanted. Like, what was I thinking? But I've never given money to a church or never given money to a person or food to a person or clothes to a person, anything like that, and regretted it. Because giving brings joy. And that's what I want to have on your heart this week as you're thinking about this. We're asking that you bring those cards back next week, and we will have them placed on up here, right? Have them bring you up to the altar and make your pledge for next year. And while you're thinking, you know, if you have issue thinking about doing online giving or first fruits where we have it taken out of your bank account, anything like that, you can see me next week once you've decided what they are, and I'll help you take care of any of those issues. Uh, but this week, focus on you and God, on whether you want to give the same, whether you want to step up, and that's between you and God, isn't it? And think about the joy that it will bring you. All right. <clears throat> okay, any other announcements? Okay. Well, let us center our hearts on worship. Even in our weakness, Christ arrives with strength and courage. And even in our sorrow, Christmas comes to bring hope and joy. So may this promise take root in our souls as we wait with patience for Christ and Christmas to arrive. And so Karen is going to light the Advent candle for this week. Jesus is coming. Our hearts shout for joy. In this season of waiting, in the preparation for Christ's arrival, we gather to celebrate the joy of our coming Lord. Joy is the message of the season. We share it loudly with our songs and our warm greetings. It is in Jesus' authentic love that we celebrate. And so on this third Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of joy, for we know that we can count on the promise that in Jesus, that in the promise in Jesus, that our joy may be complete. Please stand as you're able to begin our worship in praise and prayer.
prophets and messengers to invite your people to return to you. Open our ears to hear your message this day so that we may prepare in the wilderness of our hearts a clear way and an authentic place for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated for a moment with children. Morning. All right, Tinley, do you remember what we opened? Or Rory, do you remember what we opened last week? What did we add? The shepherd, right? The sheep and the shepherd, and we added them to the nativity last week. Well, this week, we're going to add something different. Um, but first, I want you to think about when you have really good news, how do you want to tell people about your good news? Like, if you had a really great day at school, how do you want to spread that good news? Maybe you call somebody on the phone. Maybe you FaceTime your grandparents. Maybe your parents post about it on Facebook, right? We have lots of technology that helps us spread good news. But back when Jesus is born, did we have all that technology to be able to spread that good news that Jesus was born? We did not. So instead... God sent an angel to the shepherds to announce the news of Jesus' birth. So, let's see. Rory, will you grab the bag and open that for us and see what's in there? So we've got the angel this week, right? I had strict instructions from Irene how to put the angel on there so it didn't topple over. So we got it, Irene. (laughs) All right. So I'm going to read a little bit of scripture to you from Luke that talks about the angel bringing the good news of Jesus' birth. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. 
So God sent the angel to tell the shepherds about the birth of Jesus. And then they went and spread the good news to people all around about the birth of Jesus. All right, so let's say a prayer. Bow your heads. Dear God, thank you for the good news that you sent your son Jesus to earth to live with us and die for us so that we might be with you in heaven one day. Amen. And you guys can go to Children's Church. It's time for our scripture reading this morning. Come, let's go to the mountain of God. Let's climb to the heights of God's holy word that God may teach us holy ways and guide us on righteous paths. Amen. Our first reading from, is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 1 through 10. The desert and the dry land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. They will burst into bloom and rejoice with joy and singing. They will receive the glory of Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the Lord's glory, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and support the unsteady knees. Say to those who are panicking, be strong, don't fear. Here's your God coming with vengeance, with divine retribution. God will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be cleared. Then the lame will leap like the deer, and the tongue of the speechless will sing. Waters will spring up in the desert, and streams in the wilderness. The burning sand will become a pool, and the thirsty ground, fountains of water. The jackal's habitat, a pasture. Grass will become reeds and rushes. A highway will be there. It will be called the holy way. The unclean won't travel on it, and it will be for those walking on that way. Even fools won't get lost on it. No lion will be there, and no predator will go up on it. None of these will be there. Only the redeemed will walk on it. The Lord's ransomed ones will return and enter Zion with singing, with everlasting joy upon their heads. Happiness and joy will overwhelm them. Grief and groaning will flee away. The second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look. Those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of woman, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now if you will join with our praise team as we sing our song of response, Come Emmanuel. to 
Well, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that now we are three weeks into Advent. The wait is almost over. And we've spent the last few weeks anticipating the arrival of the ultimate gift. And in the first week, we wrap the gift and prepare for what's to come. Last week, John the Baptist tagged the gift, reminding us to repent while we wait for the arrival of Jesus. And now we place the gift under the tree. But now, what kind of tree are we going to use? Well, it's one of those classic questions. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are the real tree purist in the room? All right. I said, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're in the minority now, but I'm with you, I'm with you. Uh, If that's you, you may love the thrill of selecting the perfect tree for your home. You probably love the smell and the ambiance that having a real tree brings through the Christmas season. Now, if you're the artificial tree type, you probably like the ease of having a tree that you don't have to water, that doesn't shed, and that you don't have to pay for each year. For either way, more power to you. You see, in our scripture lesson this morning, we find John the Baptist and his followers asking the question, is Jesus really who he says he is? In other words, is he the real thing? Jesus goes on to describe them what the gift of the kingdom of God is all about. But now that classic question, real or artificial, you know, the Christmas tree question, do you get a real one or artificial one? The artificial one can be pretty snazzy, but for those in the room, remember the foil tree version that you shined a rotating multicolored light on. Can I get a show of hands that remembers that? Oh my word. I was so, dis- my folks were real tree people, real tree people. Re- and then they bought that aluminum foil tree. Oh, and no lights. You couldn't put any lights on it, right? So, and they didn't buy that, you know, they didn't buy that accessory. You know, well, they did eventually, but, you know, they didn't. So we just had this new foil tree, no lights on the tree, no good evergreen smell. And, of course, there was just, we just had the one hang one color above. So it was all monochromatic, right? You either hung all, well, we hung, I think, red bulbs, and then maybe we changed the blue. But but it wasn't like with the real tree, you had some real old ornaments, right? You had some of the man, you know, homemade ornaments. You, You had multiple colors and sizes, you know. No, the foil tree. Oh, my. You didn't, you couldn't even hang tinsel on. I don't even know if they sell tinsel anymore. Am I right about that? They might not sell (laughs) that anymore, but you couldn't put tinsel on the tree. Oh, it, well, anyway. Um, Of course, today's artificial trees look like the real thing, right? Plus, they come with lights already on them. Yes, that is true, because I just bought one. (laughs) I say in all that, I just bought one. But there is, there is, But is there anything that compares to traipsing through the Christmas tree farm and saw in hand to select and cut down our own tree, anticipating the fragrance that will permeate our home over the next weeks and ignoring the impending blanket of fallen needles that will inevitably cover the floor? Or if you have a cat, I do remember that um, it, it was, was it the artificial or the real one? The cat would climb up the tree and just sort of stay, lay, found a place to lay in the tree. So I had one that didn't knock the tree over, but did climb up and sit in the tree, right? Well, anyway, in today's text, someone else asked Jesus our question. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Are you the real deal or a really good imitation, Jesus? The question occurs to just about every person in the church, including the strongest Christians. Is Jesus the real thing? Is there anything to our faith? Has the church gotten a hold of something that matters, or is this business of Jesus and Christmas just a far-fetched tale? Charming but worthless. How does Jesus answer John and his disciples? He says, in effect, 
I cannot answer for you. You have to decide on your own whether I am the real. Look at the evidence. What do you see? What do you hear? Jesus' ministry has been about enabling people to sense the reality around them in entirely new ways and to respond to it uh, prophetically. Similarly, all the miracles performed by Jesus, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the lame walking, the lepers being cleansed, and the dead being raised, remember Lazarus, right, were subversive socially, culturally, and politically. More specifically, cleansing people of leprosy would have had the effect of restoring outcasts into society. And dead being raised indicated a revival in the community. Remember Dorcas. All these deeds testify to the messianic nature of Jesus' mission. The people were confused about who this Jesus was and why John was lifting him up above himself. And when John is arrested, he believes Jesus will make his move and become the Messiah that the people are waiting for. And the reports John was given did not convince him sufficiently that he was indeed the awaited Messiah. And John and his disciples, they, they all wonder. Is he the one? Is Jesus the real thing? When John asks, are you the one, what does Jesus say to him? What is he claiming? Of note, Jesus claims that his revolution is neither violent nor vengeful, nor an uprising of a powerful few, and also that the common people are more important and just as powerful as God in God's kingdom, even greater than John himself. You see, the people wanted a, a Messiah that was going to be like King David, right? That's going to ride the horses in, that's going to have a sword, that's going to overturn, you know, the Roman Empire and restore Israel to his rightful kingdom. They were looking for a warrior. He said, Jesus said, nope. Not that kind of warrior, sorry, but I am the real deal. I am the real deal. Christ's answer is exactly the same when we ask the question. Persons have to decide for themselves on the basis of the evidence they see and hear. So part of our task as followers of Christ is to report on and name the evidence that we see and hear about today. The testimonies come from believers throughout the centuries and from persons nearer in time and space. The answers also come when people reflect on their own experiences, not just those of others. Ones that we name as experiences of Christ and Christ's ability to be present and active even here, even today. Well, come on, somebody. Did not we see Christ active in Jack's closet over, this, over these past few days? Can I get an amen? Can we testify? Can somebody from Jack Cloud testify what God did, what God, how God provided? Right? More, I mean, in abundance, not in scarcity. Abundant, more, right? More than we could count, more than we could anticipate. That's what God does, which is why giving is so important. Because when you give, well, now this is, I'm going to a stewardship thing now. When you give, that's what God does. He pours out more than you can anticipate getting and receiving. He blesses you like Jack's closet was blessed beyond all. I mean, I went down there and there was just toys and pr presents. And we were, Jack's closet was blessed to be a blessing. That's the movement of Christ and Christ's Holy Spirit. That's what we have to testify about because, folks, the churches are getting emptier and emptier because folks don't believe that Jesus is the real thing. Because some of God's people, Christians, don't believe that Jesus is the real thing. Or they're not communicating to folks. They're not testifying to folks about what Jesus has done in their lives. So, We've got a job to do. 
So if you don't have a personal story, you can just talk about Jack's closet. Amen? Because you know that was, that's a miracle working going on there. So is this Jesus the real thing? This Jesus who asked me to change my life is difficult to understand. And I, and I wish he would just make everything easy, you know, or better, not ask me to work for him. <laughs> so sometimes we wonder if Jesus is the real thing, then why is there still so much darkness in the world? In the midst of transformation, it is not uncommon to ask ourselves, is this really worth investing in? This sounds hard. It sounds like a lot of work. And it is. But are we willing to be courageous messengers, even when doing so might entail a heavy cost? Has there been a time in your life when you asked Jesus, are, are you the one? How many times do we ask this of ourselves? Here's the answer. There's nothing like the real thing, baby. <laughs> There's nothing like the real thing. <laughs> and Jesus is the real thing. Now, I found an illustration about waiting for a Savior. And in this book, Detour, some, sometimes rough roads lead to right places by Clark Cawthorn, Cawthorn, tells of a Christmas when his family encountered an unexpected house guest. It was a squirrel. Yep, a squirrel fell down the chimney into the wood burner stove in the basement of their Michigan home. And Cawthorn writes, I thought if I knew where, I thought if, if it knew we were there to help, I could just reach in and gently lift it out. Nothing doing. She says, as I reached in, it began scratching about like a squirrel overdose on espresso. Said, but we finally managed to construct a cardboard box cage, complete with a large hole cut in one side, into which the squirrel waltzed in when we placed the box against the wood burner's door. Then we let it out to the safety of our backyard. He said, later I thought, isn't it funny how before its redemption, our little visitor had frantically tried to bash its way out of this dark prison. It seemed that the harder it struggled in its own strength to get free, the more pain it caused itself. And in the end, he simply had to wait patiently until one who was much bigger, one who could peer into his world, could carry him safely to that larger world where he really belonged. And he says, and that's what we need the Lord to do for us. So what's happening in your life? How did God respond to you or how is God responding to you? When have you been blind? When have you been deaf or dead or crippled or poor? Well, come on now, let's be real. We're, some of us have been poor. We haven't always been where we are financially. Am I right about that? That's right. We have history. So how did this real Jesus turn your life around? Come on now. And how did this Jesus offer hope? How did Jesus save you? What are you calling out from your prison? What message of hope are you hearing from Jesus? What commitments will you make to follow the real Christ? So some of you know that I uh, officiated a, a funeral this week of an um, <clears throat> extended family member. And it was a difficult funeral because um, this person was addicted to substances uh, and died at 34. And here's the thing, the word came to me to offer a word of hope from out of Romans, that there is nothing in heaven or on earth that will separate us from the love of God. Amen? That's a message, that's a message that a whole lot of people need to hear. Folks in our family, in our extended family, in our neighborhood, right? They need to know that not only is Jesus the reason for this season, but Jesus is real. Jesus is the real thing. 
and that nothing will separate us from the love of Jesus and of Jesus and God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, how will you help the blind to see and the lame walk and the dead find new life? So consider this. If I submit and follow the authentic Jesus, what changes? Is Jesus the real thing? The ultimate gift is wrapped and waiting. Come and see for yourself. Amen and amen. Okay. Will you join us on our song of response, Mary, Did You Know? Mary, did you know? Let the desert rejoice and the dry land be, God, be glad, for God has come to save us. Let us confess our sin. God of majesty and glory, we are thirsty for your grace. You made a way for us in the wilderness. 
and still in our foolishness we go astray. We hide our eyes from your presence. We do not listen to your word. We are lifeless when we ought to dance and speechless when we ought to sing. Forgive us, O Lord. Speak peace to our fearful hearts. Strengthen our weak hands and make firm our feeble knees as we seek to follow in your holy way. Amen. Now return to the Lord with joy and gladness. Sing a song of redemption. Let sorrow and sign be no more. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'd like to pray for a moment before we go into communion. Great God of promise, you have come to us in Christ whose birth the angels sing. Your glory has appeared and we have seen it together. You have anointed us with your Holy Spirit and we are filled with joy. We confess we need help changing our hearts. So we criticize too much. We envy too much. We hold on to resentment too much. Straighten out our crookedness and make smooth our rough places. We pray for the earth and its well-being, for leaders who need guidance, for all who need work, for those who don't have a home, for those who suffer and those who grieve, for those whose souls are troubled, for those who need to forgive, for those who have done evil, and we ask that you convict their hearts to repentance while recognizing the capacity for sin we see in others also resides in us. God of mercy and grace, help us practice self-control and make us kind. Give us patience that we may persevere. May we be generous and rich in faith. May we be people who take delight in each other, even as you take delight in us. We pray in the name of Jesus, born at Bethlehem, who grew strong in wisdom, humility, and obedience, who was crucified, but whom you raised from the dead, the same Jesus, the same Jesus who still teaches us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, saints. So come, let us go to God's holy mountain, the mountain of love revealed to us in Christ Jesus. Let us go to join the feast of grace shown to us at this table of holy communion. Come to this abundant feast, this mountain of love, that our hearts and minds may be prepared to receive the coming Christ. So God is in this place. With the eyes of faith we see, the word is made. In communion with God, we touch the word which sustains all creation and find our true selves. The world is us now and expressed in us as well. We believe that God spoke the words into existence. And we believe that when humanity had closed their eyes, their ears, and their hearts to the divine voice, the word became flesh, living and dying, so that we could be restored as children of God. We believe that God's Holy Spirit continues to speak life to the world and calls us into a relationship with God and with each other and with our world. O oh God of self-disclosing love. We believe that on the night before love's final word was spoken through the passionate cross, Jesus gave us a way to remember the word, to hear it again. He took bread and spoke a word of blessing over it. Then, as he broke the bread, he spoke new meaning into it. This, my body is broken for you. Eat and remember me.
As with the bread, Jesus took wine and spoke a blessing over it. Then as the wine was shared, he spoke new meaning into it. This, my blood, is shed for you. Drink this and remember me. Whatever this, oh, let us prepare our hearts to receive this sacrament and, and the word it speaks. Generous God, we come to, at your invitation to hear you and to see you, to commune with you in this meal. We come undeserving and in need. You spoke life into us at the first. Speak to us again through this bread and this cup and let your word of life Fill our senses and our days. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I'm, I'm prepared.
oh God, we give you thanks for uniting us as the body of Christ and fulfilling us with joy at this table. Lead us toward the unity of your church and help us treasure signs of reconciliation. Now that we have tasted the banquet you have prepared for us, may we one day feast together in your heavenly city. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Stand as you're able for our closing song, Shout to the Lord. Wonder. 
calling us to look at the evidence and see. It is in seeing, believing, and acting that our joy may be complete. God's ultimate gift is the real thing. Live into that, spreading the word and sharing the gift as you move into the week. Amen? Amen. Go in peace. Nothing compares to the promise I have.